pain and suffering in the world, violence, injustice, poverty. Does Christianity have an answer to why is there pain and suffering in the world? We say yes, and we'll talk about it on today's edition of Truth for a New Generation. Best-selling author, speaker, and advocate for Christian apologetics, Dr. Alex McFarland. Best-selling author and apologist, Dylan Burroughs. Together bringing you truth for a new generation. This is TNG TV. Hi, welcome back to TNG Television. Alex McFarland here coming to you from the campus of North Greenville University. And we're talking about apologetics. On this series of programs, we've been going through my book, the God You Thought You Knew, Exposing Common Myths About Christianity. And one of the questions that I get as I speak all over the country and travel, oftentimes I'm in front of uh, groups of young people, and they'll ask the question, why is there pain and suffering in the world? If God loves us, why is there so much evil, so much violence, so much heartbreak? And really, if you look at world history itself, I mean, there has been, I read in one historian's book, one year of peace for every three years of war. I mean, clearly, the stage of human history has been colored by the tears of humanity and really stained by the blood of people that have fallen and been abused and killed. It is a world where things go wrong. Something inside of us stirs when we look at injustice and and moral evil. And so let's talk about this. In fact, One of the scholars that we've quoted on the program that I I really think is a great Christian thinker, he is uh, named Peter Kreeft, K-R-E-E-F-T. Allow me to recommend one of his books. He wrote a book called The Handbook of Christian Apologetics. It was published by InterVarsity. It's a really great book. But Kreeft is head of the philosophy department at Boston College up in Massachusetts. He is a great defender of the faith. And he himself went through a period of skepticism in his life, but He came out of it as a great defender of the faith. He says this regarding the problem of evil, and I would agree. He said, really, only Christianity has an answer to the problem of evil. C.S. Lewis says this, that the problem of pain and suffering, you can call it sin, you can call it evil, you can call it suffering, but the the reality that something is wrong with this world. Uh, We look around the world and say things ought not be this way. I mean, there there are cancer, there's violence, there's terrorism, there are wars, there are assassins who go in schools and shoot innocent children and teachers. Clearly, it's a world that every day's newspaper headline reminds us something is fundamentally wrong, something is broken. C.S. Lewis said this, that the problem of suffering is the perennial apologetics issue that sooner or later every Christian must be able to give an answer to, and I would agree. Now, we would say that Christianity alone has an answer that is substantive and satisfying. Because think about this. Eastern religion would say that evil is an illusion. Uh, It's Brahman. Uh, It's all part of ultimate reality. And uh, if you think there's pain or if you think there's something wrong, In Eastern thought, and sadly in much of the uh, pluralism that has infected the Western world, there's no right or wrong. There's no ultimate objective, true or false. There there just is what is. Uh, Maybe you've seen on somebody's bumper sticker the yin and yang symbol where good and evil, light and dark are forever entwined in this cosmic dance. Well, Christianity says no. There are things that are inherently good, righteous. Conversely, there are things that are inherently bad. Now, we might say, wait a minute. If God, as depicted in the Bible, is real, if God is all-powerful, all-wise, and all-good, why is there evil in the world? What we want to do, and what really is the apologist's job, if you want to be faithful to the Bible, we've got to craft or come forward with an answer to the problem of evil that doesn't compromise God's nature. Um, Some have said, well, maybe God is good, but he's not powerful enough to eradicate evil. Or maybe God could eradicate evil, but he doesn't, and therefore he's, he's partly bad. Or maybe, like so many of us, 
God is wringing his hands. He doesn't like it. He'd like to fix it, but he simply doesn't know what to do. Maybe God, some have theorized, I reject this, but maybe God is, after all, finite, doing the best he can. You know, back in the 70s, there was a book called Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? It was written by a man named Rabbi Harold Kushner. And he basically said, cut God a break. Uh, God's doing the best he can. God is limited, said Kushner. God is finite. He would fix things if he could, but he can't. So let's just make, make our way and do the best we can. Well, sadly, he had lost a son, tragically. And very often, one's circumstances do skew the way they see God. Our, our journey of life can either make us uh, receptive to God and his love or maybe harden us against God as so many have done. And I hope you're not in that uh, position. I hope that despite whatever life has sent your way, I hope you do know that God loves you. I hope you do know that he is in control. And very often things happen and they're painful. We, we have struggles and stresses. We shed tears. But what it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that God is not in control or doesn't know what to do. I really do think that the events of life and the circumstances that we all go through, God allows to cause us to turn our heart and our eyes toward him. So let's talk about caused versus allowed. Because the Bible, again, presents God as righteous. God is infinitely holy. Um, uh, in uh, the Word of God, it says that we're to be holy because He is holy. And we're ultimately going to be like God if we turn to Christ and are saved. We'll go to heaven one day. We'll be in the very presence of God. One day we'll be conformed to the image of Christ. doesn't mean that we'll be God, but we'll become holy like God. So your salvation is past, present, and future. In the past, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, and this is part of the response to the problem of pain and suffering. In the present, we know Christ, if you've put your faith in him, and in the future, you'll be with Christ. So think about this. So think about this. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved and delivered from the power of sin. One day, we're going to be delivered from the very presence of sin and suffering and evil and wrongdoing. So Christianity has an answer that is substantive and satisfying. Substantive in the sense that it logically makes sense. And we're going to unpack that. We're going to ask the question, logically, how can a good God and actual evil really exist? It's not an illusion. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It is reality. And the reality is that God is in control. God loves you. And this world that we want fixed, he wants it fixed even more so. So let's trust him. And we'll continue talking about this when Truth For A New Generation TV returns. Romans 8.28 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes this, For we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. Welcome back to TNG Television. 
Alex McFarland here. We're talking about the problem of pain and suffering. And this gets personal because all of us have experienced pain in life and maybe you're watching this program and, and you've gone through an issue and there are innumerable things that we go through. Uh, I think about the words of Corrie ten Boom. She was a survivor of the Holocaust and she and her family were Christians and they were in Amsterdam and parts of Europe during the, the Second World War. And she once said, when life knocks you to your knees, well, that's a pretty good place to pray, isn't it? Oftentimes, as we said in the previous segment, God allows things into our life to not try to make us think that he's abandoned us or, or to say that he doesn't care or is not compassionate, but the circumstances of life turn us to God. It's like Peter said in John chapter 6, when many stopped following Jesus, Jesus said to the disciples, will you go away too? Peter said, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. If not Jesus, there really is no hope. Now, we mentioned the book by Rabbi Harold Kushner, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And, and church-going families can have unemployment and loss of job, financial stress, uh, death. Uh, good people do experience bad situations, but we don't often ask the question in reverse, why do good things happen to bad people? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're sinners. All of us are. I'm a sinner. I'm a forgiven sinner, but we all know the right and do the wrong. We disobey our conscience. We've got a fundamental problem called sin, and that really is the beginning of the answer as to why there's evil in the world, because it is a sinful, fallen world. What is sin? And you read Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They, they brought sin into the world and there's been a ripple effect ever since and it comes down to us to this very day. And we don't just say, well, maybe this world is the way God wants it. No. God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to save us from our sins. Now, let's go back to that Romans 8.28 verse that's often misquoted. People say, well, we know everything is good. No, the verse doesn't say that. It says all things work together for the good in an ultimate sense. In fact, not all things are good. In fact, some things are just flat out rotten. Some things are really bad, horrible, unjust. But we have the promise that our eternal God our wise God, omniscience, he has all knowledge, omnipotent, he has all power, all potency, and he is omnibenevolent, he's all good. Think about this, a God who has power, wisdom, and righteousness can take even the worst of evils and turn them into something good. Romans 8, 28 is a great promise. All things, if we're willing to yield ourselves to God, if we're willing to submit to God, and give our life to him, humble ourselves before him. All things can be worked together for some sort of ultimate good. Now, in Genesis chapter 50, think about Joseph. You know the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors back Genesis 37 through 45. Joseph was uh, abducted by his brothers, thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, estranged from the family for many years. He goes to Egypt. There's a famine. And Pharaoh makes Joseph sort of the vice regent of the nation. Joseph, wisely led by God's Holy Spirit, uh, stores up grain, and they survive the famine. Not only do they survive the famine, but they are able to sell grain to other nations. Pharaoh basically puts Joseph in charge of the most powerful nation on earth at that point. The brothers and the family come back. They're reunited. And in Genesis 50, Joseph says something to his brothers that really almost throws toward Romans that would be written hundreds of years later. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, what you did that was wrong and intended maliciously, God is able to turn it into something good. So really, only Christianity has an answer to the pain and suffering and a view of God that tells us our God is so powerful and so compassionate that he can take the machinations of Satan, the failures and foibles of our own lives, and God can bring us to a relationship with himself, turn things around, heal our broken heart, 
give us blessing in this life and ultimately even rewards in heaven. That's why Romans can say in Romans 8, 28, that God ultimately works all things to the good. Now let's talk about the good. Scholars that go all the way back to the philosophers of ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greece have debated what is good. Now, if you ask the average person today, what is good? You know, the mid medieval scholars talked about the summum bonum, the highest good of man. You might think, well, for me to be rich, for me to be famous, to buy that brand new car, to have that uh, trophy wife and the big house, we might define good in terms of some material gain. But God has a better best for you. God has the ultimate good, the highest good. Uh, what is that? What is the goodest good, if I could use language in that way? Well, the highest good for all of us would be to know God and to be Christ-like. You might be thinking, well, gee, that's not really the good that I uh, desire for myself. I I'd like to talk more about that car. Now, listen to this. God loves you so much that he wants the highest good for you, which is a home in heaven. And so when Romans 8.28 says all things work together for the good, it may not be the desire that you have right now, but one day, and I've heard older saints of God say this, they look back over their lives and they're so grateful to the Lord for the things that he allowed. People that are wise enough and mature enough to admit it oftentimes thank God for the prayers that didn't get answered with a yes or the circumstances that didn't exactly go as they thought because God has for you a higher good than you could ever dream for yourself, a better best than you could ever even desire. Kind of reminds me one time we took my nephew to an amusement park and there was a long line at the ticket office so we let him play on a little 25 cent carousel and finally we got the tickets and we said let's go into the amusement park, roller coasters, rides, and he cried, no I don't want to leave the little hobby horse. I said trust me, there's something on the other side of that fence way better than a coin-operated hobby horse. God, in a similar way, has for you the highest good of all. And we'll talk more about that and how it can be achieved when TNG Television, Truth for a New Generation, returns. Don't go away. They're preparing me for the future by just giving me opportunities to sing in front of people. So you can have one-on-one -on -one time with the professor and the professors are here to help you. Not only help you grow in your studies, but in your walk spiritually. The faculty here, they just give more than what they're asked. Each week you meet with them just to discuss what you're learning in your music, to increase your repertoire, to get better. I think there's just something special about this school. It draws people. We get emails and correspondence. People want to know about my speaking schedule and about the Truth for a New Generation conferences that we do, the apologetics events all around the nation. We bring together Josh McDowell, great leaders, Jay Warner Wallace, the Cold Case Christianity author, and so many others. Hey, here's one website I want you to know of, truthforanewgeneration.com. That's truth, F-O-R, truthforanewgeneration.com. We've got several conferences planned, and in fact, if the good Lord allows, we're going to be going to 22 major American cities over the next five years. You don't want to miss it. We also have an app, the TNG app, 
And there are more than 150 articles that I've written on all of these topics that we do on this show. Can you trust the Bible? And why is there pain and suffering in the world? And does God exist? And what does the Bible have to say about racism? And so many things that are part of the Christian world view, the biblically informed perspective on life. So regardless of the type of mobile device you have, if you go to the App Store, you can get the Truth for a New Generation app. It's searchable. We're adding to it all the time, and I hope it's a blessing to you. The other thing I want to talk about is North Greenville University. The website of the school is ngu.edu. Uh, maybe you're thinking about college pretty soon, or maybe there's a young person in your life who's looking at where to go to school. Listen, I was just on the road, just landed from Tennessee, and I talked with several families out there whose kids were in youth group, church going, sometimes Christian school, but they go away to the secular universities. And oftentimes, four years of college can dismantle what mom and dad have worked 18 years to instill. And I would say this, that unless you go to a solidly Christian university, you will definitely hear secularism. You will definitely hear Christianity, if not America itself, marginalized and put down, and that has an impact on young people and their view of life and their view of morality and their view of, of the country. Check out ngu.edu for a, an education that is world class, fully accredited, but affirms God and the word. Uh, in fact, the motto of the school is where Christ makes the difference. And having been here nearly eight years, I can say, indeed, this is the place where Christ makes the difference, ngu.edu. Well, back to the topic at hand, the problem of pain and suffering. Let's classify uh, evil, sin, suffering, whatever you want to say, in two categories, moral evil and natural evil. And I would submit to you that both are the result of sin. Now, natural evil, we'll get to in just a minute. Let's talk about moral evil. That is not hard to understand. There are murders, there are bank robberies, there's terrorism, there's domestic violence, there's adultery, there are lies. There are so many examples of moral evil where we know the right and we do the wrong. Uh, it's not hard to understand that terrorism or germ warfare or so many of the things, identity theft online and credit card theft, all of those things are wrong, and we know that. We, we pass laws to punish those who perpetrate such things. But we have to be honest and remember that in this topic of moral evil, we're all complicit. We've all known the right and done the wrong. We've all told lies. We've all been narcissistic and made everything all about ourselves. We are sinners, and we need a savior. The problem of pain and suffering is not an indicator that there is no God. It's really proof, tangible, empirical, everyday reality reminder that we need a savior. So moral evil is the cause of human sin. Now, God offers the right, but he doesn't force us. God's Holy Spirit will tap us on the shoulder God will beckon and make overtures, whisper to us, but God does not twist our arm. God will not override your free will in the quest to bring you to himself. He will, I believe, in 10,000 ways try to get our attention, and sometimes through decisions of our own making, we wind up uh, on our back, face up before God. And that's a time that if you're wise, you'll turn to him. Frankly, if you're wise, you'll turn in before life knocks you to your knees. But back to the concept of the good. Thinkers throughout history have talked about the good, the true, the beautiful. Uh, what is good? It's what's in conformity with the character of God. And the reason you may not have that brand new car and that brand new house, maybe God in all of his infinite wisdom knows those things would lure your heart away from him. You, I'm sure you remember Tevye in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, he sang one of the most famous songs from that production. God, who made the lion and the lamb, you decreed I should be what I am. Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? Yeah, well, it might. <laughs> and maybe, maybe God knows what your 
fickle heart can stand. In fact, we think about how much trouble we can manage and still keep going. Maybe God has to ameliorate how much blessing and goodness you can be entrusted with, lest you turn from him. And so we've got to remember that God cares about the highest good, which is the health of our soul. Now let's talk about natural evil. Because people ask, well, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, twofold question. How can that possibly be the result of human sin? And how could God bring any good thing out of that? Well, the natural uh, activities of this world are the result of human sin. And I'll tell you why. Because if you read in the book of Genesis, God flooded the earth. And yes, I do believe in the global flood of Noah. In fact, there are, I've been to many parts of the world where evidence of the flood is, is part of the topography of the land and the geography of this planet. Fish fossils in deserts, shrimp fossils in the Grand Canyon. The world does seem to have been uh, flooded by water uh, at one point. The flood of Noah was sent because man was so sinful that God saved Noah and his family ultimately through the human race to send the Savior. And let me say this, the breaking apart of the continents and now even the, the plates shifting, all of that, the 23 degree tilt of the earth's axis, all the result of the flood and the flood the result of human sin. How can God bring good out of that? Well, even when there's an earthquake at the bottom of the ocean and there's a tidal wave, sad as it may be, it does release nitrogen into the atmosphere which is good for crops and plants. Lightning does the same thing. So God is still working to bring this planet to knowledge of himself. We've got to remember this is not heaven. We're not home yet. We're in a fallen world, but humanity is valuable to God. He loves the world. He loves you. He sent his son to not only save your soul, but give you victory in a fallen world and one day take you. Truth for a New Generation, in association with Alex McFarland Evangelistic Ministries, exists to equip Christians with a biblical worldview through conferences and camps. For information about upcoming events, visit truthforanewgeneration.com or give us a call at 877-YES-GOD-1. That's 877-YES-GOD and the number one. TNG TV is made possible by the friends of Alex McFarland Evangelistic Ministries. P.O. Box 485, Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. That's P.O. Box 485, Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. Or give online at alexmcfarland.com or truthforanewgeneration.com. Thanks for listening and join us again next time as we bring you more truth for a new generation on TNG TV. TNG TV.